Some may find the following disturbing. Discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to a fresh episode of GTF, Gabriel Talks Football. My name is Aldo Gandia, and what a win yesterday. We got a lot to talk about, and all week long we'll be talking about it. The win and the performance from Tyson Bagent, and the best way to stay on top of all of our programming is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Barroom Network, or if you like, uh, prefer audio podcasts, you can find us on all the major platforms. Uh, Google Podcasts, uh, Podbean, Stream, uh, excuse me, uh, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We're we're there. Just search for Barroom Network, and you'll get all of our great programming. Let me bring in the man. Oh, by the way, we got a little surprise for everyone. We'll bring in a very special guest in in around 30 or 40 minutes. But let's bring in the star of the show, Greg Gabriel. How are you, my oh, friend? Shit. <laughs> I'm good. Not no star, but I'm good. <laughs> You are a star. I just got to read through some of these comments. You know, best show on the network. Greg is 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 the guy. I can't wait to hear what Greg has to say about uh, yesterday's game. So let's get right to it, Greg. What was your impression about overall how the team played and then this rookie quarterback? Overall, how the team played the best game they played all year. Mm-hmm. Without question. I mean, very clean game offensively. No turnovers. Uh, had an eight and a half minute time of possession advantage, uh, long drives, multiple long drives, not just one. There were several of them. Defensively, held them to what, 260 yards, 200, no, 235 total yards, mm-hmm. uh, caused three turnovers, all interceptions, only had one sack, uh, but just you know, basically held them in check. And they got a bunch of those yards on that last drive that was meaningless. You know, so um, I think the overall performance was pretty darn good. And, you know, it gets back, and I've been saying that, you know, people saying, well, Flus is going to lose the locker room. He hadn't lost the locker room because you see it in the effort. Yes. So, uh, and, and I think... You know, the the guys put up an extra little bit of fight because you had a rookie quarterback in there. Who Did you see the one the, the one announcer says, I think my man's playing for nothing today. He bought 57 freaking tickets. <laughs> exactly. He said the pace check this week was going to be a lot lower than it usually is. <laughs> yeah. So you were impressed with his overall play and how he ran the offense. Do you think that uh, Luke Getzey helped him with the play plan, uh, the the play calling and, and the uh, offensive game plan? Um, yeah, but you still got to execute. Mm-hmm. You can have your game plan any way you want. You have the, the name of the game is execution, and and doing things the right way. And they did execute. Um, as far as Tyson Bajan, he was calm. He was poised. He wasn't rattled. Uh, the moment wasn't too big for him. He was totally in control throughout the game. I've said this all along. There's some special to this kid. And, I mean, this goes back to the preseason. People call me a dumbass. I say, shit, I know what the hell I'm talking about. I've done enough quarterbacks in my day. This kid has got something to him. Mm-hmm. And... I don't care what level he played at. People want to say he played Division Two. Who cares? Mm-hmm. You know, look at the numbers he put up at Division Two. Yep. And then he gets into an NFL game and said, "Yeah, no big deal. Another game." 
Yeah, and as Michael uh, says, Bajan proved he's a composed professional. It was so um, special to see how he handled the media. And there's that video of him being awarded the game ball. And he talks about we faced some adversity because of Justin's injury. And Justin Fields was right behind him. You can see his reaction throughout this entire speech. And Tyson went on to say, but you guys stuck with me. You supported me. You know, and, and he just seems to say this, the right things. And then he goes out to talk to the media and he talks about how uh, how he was he was honest he talked about how nervous he was all week but yet you know he go he went out there and he was fired up from his speech in the tunnel to the players saying excuse my language we're gonna fucking punch him in the mouth we're gonna fucking do this he was fired up and then he runs for a first down and he motions to the crowd you know let me hear you let me hear you it was an exciting performance by a guy who not a lot of people gave him a chance. Oh, I, I, Vegas lost a lot of money yesterday now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <They're> thinking Because <laughs> a lot of people took the Raiders. I don't know what the over-under was, but it was, you know, they, they probably lost on that too. But it, mm -hmm. it's um, it was nice to see that's two out of three games where the team has really played well. And what's really nice, the defense is, is coming together and, mm -hmm. and playing together. Uh, still, we got to get more pressure on the damn quarterback. Uh, but aside from that, they're doing a better job stopping the run. Uh, you're getting regulars back there in the secondary. So it's making it that much uh, tougher to throw. Stevenson's going to make his rookie mistakes. And by the way, I thought the inter the uh, interference call on him along the left sideline was a total bullshit call. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I thought the and I I um, posted it yesterday on X two. I thought the one against uh, Jalen Johnson was bullshit, and people said, "Well, he didn't turn. You don't have to turn. He was playing the ball. Mm -hmm. You're That's playing right. the ball. You don't have to turn." Right and. Um, I think I know the rules. I've been around this game long enough. <laughs> yes, you have. I, I thought, you know, both of those, both of those plays, if you saw the exact same play 10 times, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you put different refs in there, it's gonna they're gonna leave it go eight and a half to nine times. Right. Yeah. That, that's one of the things about officiating and really in any sport, you're never going to get the same exact calls from crew to crew to crew. And every crew has their own personality, so to speak. But let's stay on well, the topic. Yeah, but, the but you got to just there's one thing you got to look at it or, or they got to even it out in that. If you're going to call it tight against one team's defense, you got to call it tight against the other teams. You better. And they do weren't that. necessarily doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our guest who's going to come in in a little while has some complaints about the officials. I'm sure he's going to uh, uh, share those with us. Well, let's stay on the topic of the defense since you brought it up. One of the things that's really admirable is the last two games, they've been very good at third down uh, defense. This was their numbers for yesterday. You know, they, they, they started to re the week ranked 30th in third down allowing third down conversions and but the last two weeks they started to move up uh, i haven't checked where they're at now after most of the games from this week have been played but yesterday they were two out of nine and limiting the raiders and third down conversions that is really spectacular is there any particular reason for why this is happening greg uh, well number one you got regulars back there in the secondary that helps. <laughs> you know, Gordon's back, Johnson's back, Brisker's healthy. You're still missing Eddie, but that has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the, the pass. The pass rush is generating pressure. Mm -hmm. It's just not finishing it and getting the sack. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jalen Johnson, two interceptions. One of them a pick six. Uh, I tweeted out or posted on X that his agent has to be the happiest man in the world right now. He, he might have earned himself another million. I don't know what these, how these contracts work, but he really, he, I, he's not a number one corner, is he? What'd you say? He's not or he is? He's not. Uh, 
he's a pretty good player now. Yeah, he is. And for a lot of teams, yeah. I mean, are their corners better? Yes. Um, what Jalen hasn't done, and and by his own admission, he said, I think during preseason, they were asking him about his contract. He goes, I, there's stuff I don't, I haven't gotten done yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't create enough turnovers, yeah. you know, so he, he knew it. So that was, you know, I guess on, on, on the, after the second turnover, he's in the end zone and he's going like this. Okay. Yeah. The, the, exactly. <laughs> okay. That's what we need. And now the money's going up. Um, my personal guy asked me, goes, well, what do you think they do with them? Trade them at the deadline? It's a hell no. It's tough to find good corners. I agree. Yeah. I mean, and people are saying you trade him for a second round pick. Well, the, he was a second round pick and the salary cap isn't in, in, in a dire situation where you are forced to trade him to save the $15 million he might be asking for. Do you think it will be around $15 million? Yeah, I don't agent? know. I haven't looked at the, at the corner market. Mm-hmm. You got to, you know, you're going to find comparable players. I mean, reality is he's got three interceptions in his career. Right. Yeah, he got two of them yesterday, but he's got three in his career. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you, you don't look at one game. You got to look at, at, at the whole body work. Plus, mm-hmm. he's had some durability issues. So, it, he's going to get a lot of money. Right. I mean, you, you and I could live off it. Trust me. Oh, and, yeah. And, and <laughs> is he going to get exactly what he wants? Well, nobody ever gets exactly what they want. But it doesn't I, work know, that way. It'll it'll work itself out. Mm-hmm. Uh, C.J. Williams asks if he's a top fifteen cornerback. I think he's a top twenty twenty five cornerback. I wouldn't say top uh, fifteen. Now that's just a guess on my part because I'd have to look at the list of corners and and. But what do you think? Is could could he be a top fifteen? Yeah, I I think he's. I've always thought he's darn good. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he can he can take out a receiver if he really works at it. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's hard to do what you you know you can put him up against the best and he's going to play well but mm-hmm. not only that i mean you know he's a complete corner because he'll come up and support the run and he'll hit yeah. you you know and, and there's other guys that sit and wait for the play to come to them but he attacks it I and mean, he's a he's a good football player mm-hmm. he um his counterpart tyreek stevenson has made plenty of rookie mistakes but he's also showing a lot of promise that he is going to be a stalwart at that cornerback position for the Chicago Bears. Do you agree with what I just said? Oh, yeah. I No, it is. You need experience. And and they know, okay, we're sticking a rookie back there. He's going to go through his growing pains. He's And, and the refs are going to – like that interference call yesterday. If that was Jalen or, uh, you know, one of the top corners in the league or something like that, they probably don't throw that flag, mm-hmm. but it's a rookie who's already had a bunch. We're throwing the flag. You know, they, yeah. it's not like they don't know what's going on before the game starts. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, they know they what the weaknesses are. The referees know just as much as the other team knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the officials take time from their jobs as salesmen, as bank presidents, and so forth, and talk about you know what to look for. I'm still on that thing that we should have full-time refs. Uh, my guest and I had talked about it last night. We believe there should be full-time uh, referees and the rest of the week, they be, should be studying film and looking for tendencies and working on techniques to communicate better with one another. Cause uh, this is a multi-billion dollar sport and you don't have full-time referees. It's like, Oh my goodness. What's no, I, I, I get it, but there's a long off season. What are they going to do then? Yeah, I'll go go officiate other games in other countries or uh, schools and, and stuff like that. Really perfect the art, train future generations of officials. There's plenty of things they can do uh, for for the money. Okay, give them a good four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year and have them work uh, and become the absolute best officiating crew in any sport a- anywhere in the world. But enough. Well, about some, that. you give them four or five hundred thousand dollars, and some are taking a pay cut. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> that is very, very true. I mean, a lot of these guys are attorneys and, and other things, and pretty darn good ones. Yes, indeed, indeed. I, you know, I, I, it's not like they're they're teaching seventh grade. 
Yeah, I, may, and maybe I feel this way because I'm incapable of being really good at two different professions. So uh, Vince says, uh, although the problem is these refs are often professionals in other fields. Oh, yeah, that that's what uh, Greg just said. And so, yeah, it is tough. So I, I'm just wondering, can't you find somebody who loves – the game of football so much that they'd be willing to take three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year uh, to work regularly on this sport and perfect it to the point where it, it it's almost zero defects when they're calling a game. But that's a topic for another show. Let's get back to the defense. Talk to me about this pass rush and the differences that you have seen in the play calling since Allen Williams was calling the place and Matt Eberflus has, has called the, uh, the place. Well, Matt has gradually gotten more assertive, aggressive. You know, he, he still not anywhere close to what some coaches do as far as, you know, sending pressure. Um, there was one he had uh, Kyler Gordon coming in one play. I remember that, you know, he'll send a linebacker every once in a while. He'll never send more than five. Usually mm-hmm. goes four, sometimes five. But wh- where you see some guys, they're sending six and trying, and, you know, and then you have an overload situation and something's going to happen. Um, probably the best way to do it is a combination of the two. Uh, I, I wish you'd do more because just the, People we got, like Ngakwe's got two. We should have four. Um, and because the two misses he had. But that's not good enough. And, you know, and, and, and we're not, you know, like Jones got his first sack yesterday of the season. You know, it, we're, the Bears are around the worst in the league as far as generating sacks. So that's a big thing. And I keep saying, you Two of their premium picks are going to be pass rushers this year. You can take that to the bank now. Mm. You know, I don't know what the other thing's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be a quarterback. I don't know if it's going to be an offensive lineman. But I guarantee you two of them are going to be pass rushers. Do you think that they would bypass Marvin Harrison Jr. for a pass rusher? Given Um, that everyone says he's probably the best receiver to come out of the in the draft in in many years. Yeah, but nobody in the NFL is saying that. That's what the draft are saying. True. You you follow what I'm saying? Because NFL people don't say anything this time of the year. It it it's the draft next. And I'm not downplaying his talent. The guy is ultra talented. But Mm -hmm. go through drafts, because I always do that. And find out over the last, and, and there's been more receivers drafted in the last 10 years than there was in previous years. How many go in the top five? Yeah. Right. And what's the yeah. highest number you take them at? Because it's, well, while it's a very important position, you got to, you know, what, what number are you drafting at? Mm-hmm. And that's number one. And number two is like, what other premium need do you need do you have? And when I say th- those positions are pass rusher, tackle, corner. Mm-hmm. When when you got your lines, you got a quarterback, you got your lines taken care of, and you got some corners. Then you say, okay, now I'm going to get my receiver. You know, take a first round receiver. Because you can go through it. We've talked about this before, although you know how many great receivers have been drafted in the second round? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And even third round, you know, I mean, Jerry Rice was a third rounder, wasn't he? Or, or a fifth No, he was a first rounder. Jerry was Rice was. Okay. 17th I, draft, I think. 17th pick, I think. But, yeah. um, you know, the guy yesterday we go against, was, was he, he was a second rounder. A second rounder from, my, what was it, Long Beach State or something, someplace out west? Fresno. Fresno, there you go. Yeah, but, you know, here's the thing, uh, Greg. From a philosophical standpoint, somebody who's made decisions on acquiring players, if how much of a te- how much does a team need superstars? Because if you think that Marvin Harrison is a superstar and then you got Jared Verse and you've got to make that choice, I need that pass rusher, and Verse, although he hasn't played well lately, um, it, Verse could be that pass rusher. Do I select the guy I think is going to be a superstar, Marvin Harrison, or do I select a pass rusher who could be at least very good? Uh, that's a tough call, isn't it? 
Well, and first of all, it's too early to really have the discussion because you don't know where you're going to be picking. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're going to have one high pick from Carolina. Okay. How high the Bears pick is going to be? Who knows? Mm-hmm. Could it be in the top five? Yeah. Could it be out of the top 10? Yeah. And then if they're, if, and, and you got to let the whole situation of the quarterback thing, and we, you know, which is, should be an important part of the show today, play out. Who's going to be the freaking quarterback? Yes, indeed. Now, I personally believe Justin Fields will not play this week. You know, there are some rumors that he's hurt a lot worse than they're letting on to be. Really? Yeah. I mean, that it, it's, um, you know, it might it maybe miss one more game and possibly two more games. Well, now play the hypothetical game. So let's say he misses this week and, and the following week. And this kid plays good and they're winning. Mm-hmm. You putting him back, you putting Fields back in? That's a tough call. It depends. I now, think now, Flew, Flew said yesterday, Justin Fields is our quarterback. He did. Well, and, and I'm this is all hypothetical because I, but you know, Poles is in charge of the 53 and he's got to be the guy doing the drafting. Mm-hmm. And he can go, yep, yeah, but we didn't draft that guy. He struggles. And this other kid from D2, Shepherd University, comes in and it's like, eh, we're playing out in the sandlot. Yeah. You know, and, and now to worry in the time. And not only does he does make mistakes, you know, so mm-hmm. he's made one mistake in two games and he readily said the, the check down was there. I tried to get the big one and I just threw it. Um, but I think he's the type of kid that won't make the same mistake twice. I get, you know, there's another word. I said he's got some special to it. But there's another word we use in the draft room and meetings with quarterbacks, and that's the word it. Does he have it? Mm -hmm. And whatever the fuck it is. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'll go back to the second preseason game he played, and we talked about it. Mm -hmm. He has got it. I have never seen a kid from that low level come into the NFL and play with such poison confidence. Yes. Like it was yes. nothing. Yeah. And, and we talked about, about it. You said he came from Shepard. And I said, I don't care. No, I, you know, I agree. I've him. always I've always had hope in the guy. Now, you know, yeah, he's a division two guy. There hasn't there haven't been, you know, there wasn't a division two quarterback on an NFL roster last year. It's it's uh, it's it's this is a an incredible story. If this guy continues to prove that he has it, he comes from a division two school and his father is a arm wrestler. I mean, this is a movie. This is a movie waiting to happen. I'm super excited, and I hope that. Justin Why you want to produce the movie or write it or what? Uh, I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I I hope that Justin Fields does play so that we can get to a point where we have two viable starting quarterbacks, and then you make a trade and pick up more assets or pick up players who are ready to contribute for to a championship team. I do believe that the that the Bears are going to try to make every effort to get fields out there, but also try to get as many starts for for Bajent as possible. But you're right. If they start going on a winning streak with Bajent at the quarterback position, that's going to be the biggest controversy in Chicago sports for years and years and years. Um, say, I, I, I can answer that in a couple ways, and I'm just trying mm-hmm. to be fair. Sure. And and take my own feeling out of it. Poles didn't draft Fields. He inherited Fields. Right. Okay. I don't know what Poles' feeling was on Fields when he came out. Um, that's going to play into it. But let's go to San Francisco last year. All oh, this is hypothetical. We know this, mm-hmm. but it's a good, mm-hmm. it's a fun discussion to have. Indeed. San Francisco trades the world to get Trey Lance. 
third pick in the draft, same as year as, as Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. And he has injury problems. And when he does play, he doesn't play that well. And, you know, we, we talked about him that, that draft year and how oh, I, I never saw it. I never saw a top 10. I never saw a first rounder, let mm-hmm. alone, a, you know, a, a top three guy, only because he played one game his final year. That's through no fault of his own. That was COVID. Um, but, and he played in a predominantly running offense. So you just didn't have enough reps, but regardless, they invested a lot in him. There's no question he's talented. Then last year, last pick of the draft. Well, we'll take this kid from Iowa state, Brock Purdy. Well, by the way, I followed a lot. I liked Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought he was a mid round guy. Um, was unsure of his arm talent. He didn't have a great supporting cast, but he was a very consistent football player. Okay, now you put him in the NFL, and what separates some of these guys is is from the neck up. You know, how quick they can learn, how quick they can process right. and decipher and get the damn ball out of their hand. Mm-hmm. And now this kid, he's one pick away from being a, a free agent, just like Tyson Bajan. So really there is no difference, you know, mm-hmm. last pick in the draft. And he gets in and he, because of injury, he has to go in. They didn't take him out after that. He was too good. And mm-hmm. that's what could happen here. And it's a hard decision to make, and you're going to piss some people off. But if you watch, if this guy's got to play a few games and he goes through another game and another mistake-free game, they win the game, how do you pull them out? Right, right. It's, it's It's a tough, tough decision that will have to be made. And I get everything that you're saying, uh, but they're Whoop. just uh, – are you all right? That's what I want to know. <laughs> there was, we go. You you didn't fall on the floor, right? It was the phone. <laughs> uh, CJ Williams has a question a phone. about the phone fell on. I got the phone propped up on my laptop. Uh, uh, CJ Williams has a question. He says, "Can you improve arm strength?" So there is this kind of storyline that Tyson Bajan doesn't have the arm strength of other quarterbacks. Now he said in the press conference, "I have a cannon." I so, got a cannon. Yeah, he that's what he he does, right? And yeah. He's got a real strong arm. Yeah, it might not be as as strong as Justin Fields. Justin Fields got one of the strongest arms in football. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and. He, you know, I think for that, they, they pulled him out for that one play. He could have very easily done it. My personal thinking was when he did it, they did, you know, your ch- chances he hit an interception are better on that play than almost any other play on those mm-hmm. Hail Marys. Just, you know, you don't want to hurt his stats by throwing the Hail Mary. <laughs> Let the other guy do it. And if it, you know, it's the last play of the half, who cares if it gets intercepted? But, you know, th- there's, there's no problem with his arm strength. But to answer the question, can you improve arm strength? Yes. Mm-hmm. And it, and I, when I learned this, I was working for the Giants. Jim Fossil was the head coach. Before that, he was an offensive coordinator and a quarterback coach in the league and a former quarterback. And, and I was of the belief that, now this goes back, it's over 20 years now that you couldn't improve arm strength. And then you start looking, guys who have stronger arms in college, or rather stronger arms in the pros than they had when they were in college. And the first guy that comes to mind is Drew Brees. And you can look at Tom Brady, and you can look at Peyton Manning, all of them, their arm strength, power, velocity, all improved once they got to the NFL. Part mm-hmm. of it is, you know, it's developing grip strength, your strength in your forearms, strength in your triceps, 
but it's doing the right exercises and you and that you can work on those particular muscles where your velocity coming through the ball or throwing the ball is going to be a little bit more to put an extra little zip on it. Right, right. You know, they're, they're getting older, physically more mature. You know, this kid, you know, who knows what the hell kind of weight program they had at, at, at Shepard and what he was being that he was a quarterback, what was he required to do? Now, it sounds by you know, during the week, somebody asked him, what would you be doing um, if you weren't playing football? And he said, cross training and being ripped. So that tells me he likes to work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he exactly. was probably working out more, but he still, you, you could put 10 pounds on him, fill him out a little bit more. Yeah. You know, and his, his father's done a lot of training because he's a world champion arm wrestler. And so you got to believe that uh, uh, Tyson has done some arm wrestling in his life. And I, I bet you already, he's got a, a, a grip, as strong as John Buffon's brother. That's an inside joke because uh, he, John Buffon's brother was here in Chicago and he shaked everyone's hand at my home and he left a bunch of broken phalanges from his strong grip. But uh, I'm going to bring in our special guest in a moment, but I want to get a couple of questions in first. Uh, PZ asks, Greg, this is not a Fields versus Bajan question. What progress have you seen from Justin Fields in his 33 NFL starts? Well, remember three weeks ago, I gave, or four weeks ago, I gave up. I put up yep. the white flag, and then he put together two pretty strong performances. Mm -hmm. But you were saying, but he's got to continue to do this. And then last week, he was, it was like back in, Week three, you know, so I just look at a guy who's never played in the NFL and he processes so much quicker and he gets the ball out of his hand so much quicker. Granted, they weren't thrown downfield. That was part of their game plan. You know, they wanted to get, uh, take basically the, 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 uh, their pass rusher, the Raiders pass rusher, Crosby, out of the game. So mm -hmm. they did a lot of quick things. And the other thing I noticed, what they did early, because the Raiders are big on the defense in the interior defensive line, you know, mm -hmm. real big. And so, and they wanted to run, so they had to tire those guys out. They were going to the perimeter a lot in the first quarter. Yeah, make those big, make those big hogs run. Tire them out. And actually, that was pretty damn smart because that's what I thought they were going to go. They're trying to tire this guy's ass out. And then he can, then they'll be able to run in the middle. And what happened? They ran in the middle. Yeah. All right. Let's bring in our special guest now. Uh, this gentleman is all the way from England. He came here uh, because the good people over at Bears Country Productions started a GoFundMe page. Uh, this gentleman is also one of the co-hosts on the Barroom Network's Barfly Tailgate Show. His name is Chris Watts. Chris, Chris how, are how are you, my friend? I'm doing absolutely great, fellas. And I must admit that I'm really, really nervous uh, to talk to Greg. This is the most nervous I've been on my whole trip is that I'm going to be talking to Greg Gabriel. He's so breaking up there. I can't. Can you? Can you hear him? Can you hear me all right, Greg? Now I can. All right. Well, we don't need Aldo on the screen anyway. <laughs> but no, Greg, but Greg it's, it's just awesome to have this opportunity to talk to you. I, I love I love the show you do with Aldo. And uh, I must admit, I'm quite nervous talking to you because you're like the real deal in my eyes. Uh, so uh, thanks. For, thanks well, for don't be nervous. I'm just I'm just an ordinary guy. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you said that because like I'm, I'm a good a little bit like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean. I mean, I went to the last two Bears games, and uh, especially the Vikings game, I thought Justin Fields was probably the, one of the worst quarterbacks I've ever seen in my life live. You know, it was so, sort of flat. The scheme didn't help him at all. I mean, I've seen better quarterbacks, amateur quarterbacks back in the UK who played better than in that game. And I've just sort of... I, I personally, I'm a bit like you, Greg. I sort of think 
like it's time to move on from fields maybe because i feel like the club's like being held to ransom over one player is he going to work out well is he not um and I, the thing I like about Virgin is, is, is I just like how he seems to operate between the huddles. He seems to do things at a really nice pace. You know, he seems to be very organised. You know, when he's in the huddle, he seems to get him out of the huddle really quick. Where feels to me always seems a bit lethargic and a bit slow. Um, and also as well, I just think that the defence is playing so much better uh, than we did do at the start of the season. Especially, I still think we need a bit more pass rush. But I think like the linebackers... Absolutely. And the linebackers and the, the DBs are playing really well, uh, even though we've had quite a lot of injuries in the safeties. But it's such a joy to talk to you, Greg. I've watched you for so long on the on the um, on the bar on the bar room, and um, yeah, it's such a blast. And uh, yeah, it's just amazing to talk to you. I yeah, I I can't disagree with anything you said, Chris. And um, to me, uh. Justin Fields is an anomaly because you don't know what you're getting from week to week now. Mm -hmm. it's even, you know, when he makes some big plays, it's a special plays. They're like, they're wild plays. Mm. Yeah, oh, yes, you, definitely, yeah. Okay. But he can make a wild play and then a bonehead play, you know, a minute later. Mm. And when you pressure him, it causes problems. And, and, I, I read a thing, uh, Brad Biggs, 10 comments, you know, how many times he's been sacked, uh, how many sacks this year, how many sacks last year, and how many were really on him mm. versus the offensive line. And it's about 50% are wow. on him and not the offensive line. Well, and that's so amazing. that's a problem. But you know mm. what? We can sit and say whatever the hell we want and – it's not that, you know, it's an opinion, but it's what does the coaching staff think? Because they're going to, they're the guys who are going to make the decision going forward. Mm. I, I mean, I mean, I agree with you, Greg, uh, regarding Burgett, that if he keeps playing well, then I don't know how you can sort of pull him out of the, pull him out of, you know, start being a starting quarterback because it's sort of like what happened no, wait, in the say, last... say, say that again, Chris. I didn't uh, I'll just get everything say... you said. You won't do my with my terrible Yorkshire accent. That's what it is, Craig. <laughs> but <laughs> um I just I just think um, you know, if, if Bajan keeps playing like he does and the Bears keep winning, I just can't say you can justify putting Justin Fields back in. Because at the end of the day, you you play the game to win. So you want to put the best, you know, the people who are playing best out on that field. Uh, and I just I just think um I just think Bergen, it just seems to have a lot more control. I think Fields, especially last week, he just seems so, so lethargic and slow of his reads. But I think um, I think Fields gets away with a lot of criticism because he's such a good athlete. You know, he's, he's like an Adonis. He can run like a cheater. I think that's. I think he's managed to get away with a lot of sort of bad play just due to the fact that he's such a good athlete. No, I, 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 I don't disagree. And somebody put a comment up there that Lance Briggs said Justin sits until Bajan starts losing. Uh, well, he's going to sit until he's physically ready to play. Mm. I mean, if you can't grip the football, that means you can't throw the football. And what's a quarterback supposed to do? Mm. Um, there are rumors that he's still a few weeks away. Who knows what the hell the truth is? Because you know, they're not going to tell you on an injury situation. So, uh, you know, I just, I've thought since training camp, I'm repeating, oh, drop the phone again. I thought <laughs> since training camp that uh, this kid had some special to him. Mm. And so far, I've been right. Mm. And if I find a player that's got special to him, uh, this is me talking, I'm not sitting him. No, I'm the same. I'm the same. Because the decision here, – here's why, Chris, is that the decision you got to make is coming up next April. Do I got to draft a quarterback or is he mm. sitting right there now? Mm. No, I and mean – Oh, well, Caleb Field might be generational. Well, who says Tyson Bajan isn't generational? Mm. You haven't – you know you know what I mean? I mean, for a guy who started his first game with his background – that was a remarkable game. Oh, yes. 
Yes. I mean, I mean that. I think that'll be a nice situation for the Bears if if Burgett does keep improving. That you know, we don't have to worry about giving Fields a big contract when his rookie deal ends. You know, runs out because I couldn't pay Justin Fields twenty five million a year from the incos the inconsistent play. What is is that? Over well, the they got to make years? a decision at the end. They got to make a decision really at the end of this year. Right. Right. Fair enough. Chris, You're breaking up. I can't hear you. On the bottom of the screen. You're not, sorry, buddy. Re read that comment on the bottom of the screen. Uh, a good running game and a good defense. And Burgett will be fine with the new OC. And I, yeah, I, I could definitely believe that. I'm, I still thought some of the, the, the player calling was a bit iffy yesterday. Too many bubble screens. Too many times he's always in a shotgun, which I, I don't like a player being in shotguns. You can't really... Do the you know the, the play action sort of off the running game. So um I'm still not set up on Getsy at all. I've, I mean last week it was like it was like going back to the first game of the season. I kept thinking, well, we had so much set success against Washington. Why aren't you keeping that sort of game plan and going? Because it obviously works with Justin I, Fields. Um I just find that very inconsistent, really. I can't again. I can't. You're breaking up. I can't get everything you're saying, but I'm, I'm reading some of the comments that come across, and um, they're saying like Bajan's statistics were hurt because he didn't uh, throw that much in the fourth quarter. Well, you know what? He threw enough to win, win the game, and that's all he had to do. Mm -hmm. You know, the object is to win the game, and if you got to throw 30 times one week and 15 times the next week, so what? As long as you win. But in saying that. So assume he's going to start next week against the Chargers. You know, it's basically an indoor stadium there. So um, mm -hmm. they're going to have perfect weather conditions. I think they're going to give, you know, he's he's got this game, game and a half under his belt. They're going to give him a little bit more to do next week. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to add to it. And, and it's like he, he knows the thing. It's just, you know, they didn't want to, put him in position where he had to sit back there. Well, they had one of the best pass rushers in the league coming down on him. And I thought that was smart on, on Getz's part because, you know, he's been faced, faced a lot of criticism this year. So when he does something good, you got to praise him. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, like next week, you're going to be facing Khalil Mack. I know Bose has been hurt, so who knows if he's going to play. But they got some pass rushers on that team, too. But mm -hmm. they got some other weaknesses. And mm -hmm. it's just a matter of playing better, and the defense has got to keep getting better. Yep. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, Chris, you got one last question for, for Greg? Oh, I'm trying to think now. Greg, would you, would you want to move on from this coaching stuff at the end of this season, or – do you feel like they deserve another year? I, it's way too early. There's, there's too what, early. 10 games left. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got to – they're not going to – regardless, they're not changing the staff in the middle of the year. Okay? Mm. That, that That is usually more disastrous than anything you can do. And there's nobody on the staff you could make as a head coach to begin with, um, mm -hmm. at least not in my opinion. But, right. you know, what happens when you change a coaching staff like that, you know, guys stop playing hard. Injuries can mount up because they're not playing hard. You know, there's a lot of things that are part of making that change that, you know, that you don't notice. Mm -hmm. and, and so you just let it play out and then – you do make a decision at the end of the year what it's going to be. You're going to keep the guy or you're going to move on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's um, got a long way to go. We're, yeah. we're more than half a season to go yet. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, Greg, can I just say thank you for letting me talk to you? It's been an absolute awesome experience. A little bit nerve wracking, but very awesome. Oh, don't, and, be, um, don't give me this nerve wracking stuff. Just talk. 
It's all I do. <laughs> yeah, no, but when you talk, Greg, you make sense. That's the difference between me and you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just, I don't have I don't have the Cockney accent. <laughs> well, yeah, I just I just like to say thank you, Greg, and um, I just I really enjoy the show. Well, thank and, you. Uh, I'm bear down to you, mate. Bear down. Thank you, my friend. That is Chris Watts. You can find him on Sunday mornings here on the on the Barroom Network. He is a part of the Barflat Tailgate Show, and you know Chris uh, had a tremendous experience. We didn't get a chance to ask him all these questions, but he was one of the seventy five people holding the U.S. flag at the start of the game during the national anthem. He was interviewed by Larry Mayer over at ChicagoBears.com. He was interviewed by WFLT FLD TV again. Because of the great job the Bears Country Productions did in bringing Chris here, uh, raising money and uh, hosting him for the entire week. And I've had the pleasure of uh, hosting Chris this weekend. And he's just a fabulous guy with lots and lots of stories to share. And he his passion for the Chicago Bears is second to none. He's a great, great guy. Greg, back to the subject of the Chicago Bears. I see a lot of comments, Fields versus Bajan. Some people are defending Fields, saying we're too hard on him. Some people are saying Bajan deserves a chance to prove himself. What do you think of this? Really, it's going to become, I sense it, it's going to become a milestone because I do believe that Bajan is going to incrementally improve week to week to week, and people are going to, this is going to be a real quarterback controversy. Do you sense that too? Yep. <laughs> you know, it, it, if he, if he, if he, you know, shits his pants next week, that's a different story. <laughs> but if he goes out next week and plays good, yeah, what, that, yeah you got a problem. Well, how, how you, how do you justifiably put the other guy in? You know, and I go back to what happened in San Francisco last year. You know, everybody thought Purdy was going to be an afterthought. The guy's only lost one game since he's been in there, I think. You know, so, and San Francisco obviously got a lot better roster. But I don't care where they came from. I care about talent. And this kid's got talent. Greg, I would imagine. a lot of talent. Yeah, I would imagine that in your decades of scouting Although quarterbacks. Although you're frozen. Uh, am I still frozen? Can you no, hear no, me? No, you're not. Okay. Yeah, I can I hear would you. Imagine, I would imagine in your years of scouting quarterbacks, you've learned a few things about scouting quarterbacks, but yet it is not a science because you got – Tyson Bajant won his football game this week, and all of the other first-round draft picks, I think there were three or four who started this week, they all lost. How is it that a guy like with the talent and moxie of a Tyson Bajant falls through seven rounds of a draft? Well, first of all, and um, but that didn't answer your question. How does he fall through the draft? He was a D2 player. He got to the senior bowl. Everybody knew about him. It's not like nobody knew nobody in the National Football League knew about this guy. He was invited to the senior bowl, you know, held his own there. Uh, but when you look and, and, and you can we can uh, use Brock Purdy again. Brock Purdy had a pretty decent career at Iowa State. And he's the last pick in the draft. You know, and what happens with quarterbacks is the top guys go fairly high. And then there's, you get a lot of talented guys that go real low or even go into free agency because teams are comparing them to a player. You know, you, you know, the guy's going to, when you bring him in, he's going to be your, at best, he's going to be your two and he's probably going to be a three as a rookie in most cases versus a guy who could help you in the rotation or something like that. So the immediate return comes from the position player. And so then quarterbacks, in, especially in day three, get pushed down or pushed out of the draft and you get them late. I mean, should this kid have been drafted? Yeah, in hindsight, yeah. But and I, I think it was Biggs wrote today that the Bears thought 
thought about taking them. And, you know, they probably had a higher rated guy or whatever. But then they also like, you know, we signed a quarterback, a free agent quarterback. I shouldn't admit this, but it's so late. They're not going to kill me anymore. We had a deal done in the middle of the fifth round with this kid. You know, on day three of the draft. So or it was two days then. So we knew we had the kid. We just had to hope nobody else was going to take him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I there's comments in the You're freezing chat up again, room, Aldo. But you can hear me, though, right? Maybe not. <laughs> I guess when, he's, when I'm frozen, he can't I hear me. I can hear you. You keep freezing, okay. but I can hear you. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so there's a lot of comments in the chat where people are uh, saying, you know, pump your brakes. It's only one game. And I agree. It's only one game. We're not going to the Super Bowl with Tyson Bajan. I truly believe that. Uh, and he still has a lot to prove. But and but somebody posted that the defense won their game. It, it, this was a complimentary football win. The defense did their job. The running game did their job. The quarterback did his job. Everybody did their job. So I don't think that we should make these kind of uh, hidden shots at the quarterback. He did enough to win in his first NFL start, and that should be appreciated. Uh, Greg, you want to comment on that? Although I didn't get one thing you said there. Everything was broken up. <laughs> uh, I got about uh, so, every fifth word. Okay. Uh, that connection of yours, I'm going to go over there and fix it myself is what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, I got so these I'm extenders, gonna... but it, it's I, I'm not sure I got it that those even set up right. And I'm and yeah. actually I'm I'm, I'm using the hard line. Uh, well, no, oh, on the phone, the, it's all Wi-Fi. So the, it's all Wi-Fi, uh, it is the extenders because I'm on the phone. And, and yeah, so um, I don't know. Yeah, so I can uh, go to another room and it might be better. Yeah. Read read this. Can you read that? It just froze again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Doug is saying we had zero passes over 15 yards. If when that feels we had zero passes over 15 yards. Yeah. And if if that were fields, we would crucify him. But when a D2 quarterback does it, we crown him for the future. What do you think about that? That has everything to do. Yeah. That has everything to do with what the game plan was and getting the ball out quick. So that Crosby would not be a factor in the game. Mm Mm-hmm. That had nothing to do with the guy's talent. Right. Right. Um, you know, so, so and, people can l- l- take a stat and work it any way they want. But it, it's you, you set up a game plan to win the game. And you had it, you know, you're going against one of the best pass rushers in the game. Um, they were, most of the time, he's up against a rookie tackle and Darnell Wright, uh, who's, who, like Stevenson, is going through his growing pains. So you make – I'll say it this way. Had Field been in the game, they would have done the same thing. Mm-hmm. Unless he was unless he tried to force it downfield or whatever. But they did what they had to do. Don't forget they used up over 34 minutes of, of clock, time of possession. Their game plan was to run the football, control – control the game and move the chains. And when you look at how many long drives they had, who cares if they threw it 15 yards down the field? They won the freaking game and they won it basically no turnovers. They played a flawless game. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the offensive line, Greg? Uh, We're getting questions like from Jeff saying, what do you think happens when the offensive line is fully healthy and evaluate their play yesterday? Well, they played well yesterday. There's no question. And I thought one of the holding calls on Borum was a bad call. Um, The other one was pretty good call. The, I think, you know, they, they had their best people in right now, but 
When Davis gets back, that means Tevin goes back to the left side. And, and we know why here can't snap the damn ball. So what happens to him? And I, you know, I've been thinking about this because in my opinion, you get into the next year and one of the five best is going to be Carter. And my thinking is put that guy at center. And now you got to be smart enough to play center because you got to be able to, and, and, you know, I don't know that about him one way or the other, but you'd have three big, strong guys in the middle. And, and <laughs> that'd be pretty tough to match, but you got to learn how to snap the ball. It's not that it's that hard, but you know, you're playing the game a little bit differently. Now you can have a veteran guard calling the, uh, the offensive line uh, protections, so to speak, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be the center, but the center, you know, he, he, he kind of directs traffic for the, for the line. Uh, if Carter is capable of it, so you have the best guys playing, I might think about doing that. I mean, that, that's just me because I, you know, he's got ideal size for it. He's very, very athletic. They could do a lot with him. And then you've got really that's five guys that potentially is damn good. Yeah. I, I'm impressed. Assuming, with assuming Braxton Jones is going to be fine. Yes, that is a huge uh, if, and we hopefully need him healthy back at that left tackle position to see if he is going to be the future left tackle. That's an important well, part. I, I don't there, – if, if, if his neck is fine, there's not a doubt in my mind he's a left tackle. It's a left tackle. I got no problems with, with Braxton Jones, a left tackle. I think that was a steal. Greg, though, he, his first few games this season, he regressed. He wasn't even as good as he was last season. What I hope you're not using pro football focus as a guide. No, just my eyes. Uh, no, I, I I tend to disagree because uh, um, he was anchoring better. His run blocking is good. You know, he had a problem with anchor. Part of, you know, these guys, none of these guys played in the damn preseason. Mm-hmm. So were they ready to play when the season started? The first couple of games. First couple of games were basically like the preseason. The offense and, and the line as a whole, you know, cohesiveness. Um, they still haven't played together yet. You know, it's crazy. It's like over the last year and a half, there's been a different lineup just about every week. So when you finally get some cohesiveness, they got a chance of being pretty good. But I. Until I see differently, I'm sitting in, in Jones' corner 100% of the time. Okay. Put that on the record, everybody. Uh, Jamal wants to know if there is a running back controversy in Chicago, given this man's performance, 88 yards on 16 carries, three receptions for 31 yards, a total of three touchdowns, two rushing, one receiving Greg, do you feel that Deontay Foreman should be given the most of the snaps in Chicago once all three running backs are healthy? No, I think there's going to be a um, running back by committee. But this is something, yeah, we saw his tape last year. You knew he was capable of doing this. Guy's a good player. Um, The only reason... He wasn't dressing, and he would have had – was because Travis Homer is a fixture on special teams, and none of the other running backs are. So you, you've got to have that special t- – so you go into a game and be heavy at running back. You could dress them. They did that in the first game, and, and they'd be heavy at running back. He'd have four running backs, uh, but then you got to take another position player away. And so, you know, I, I get what they were doing, but when you come out and you have a game like he did, and he was, you know, okay, I'm going to prove it to you type of game. And he rose to the occasion. 
uh, and he's a punishing runner. But, you know, if you watch his career, that's the kind of player he is. That's what, that's what I expected as soon as I got him. Um, he doesn't have that breakaway ability and elusiveness that Herbert has, but he's got power. He can move the pile. Him and Roshan would be a bitch to have to tangle with time after because they both run really hard. Right. Greg, I'm of the opinion that any one of our running backs could, would have had a similar day that Foreman had because the offensive line blocks so incredibly well. Yeah, I well, Olin had a, a post yesterday, and it was like 15 plays, 8 minutes, 26 seconds or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. with – Couple exclamation points, and I just and then I retweeted that and said, "A lineman, an offensive lineman's dream series." You know that that you have that kind of thing, and that's when all they got to do is go out there and, and run block. They love that shit now, because then it's man on man, and and you just got to beat up the guy across from you, and that's what they were doing. Um. Compare Thomas Jones. And you know what? With- the other thing, did you see the enthusiasm? The enthusiasm the offensive line had during the I, game? Yeah. I think they were happy that the quarterback was getting the ball out so quickly, but that's another story. Sorry, guys, in the chat room. Um, no, what, but I'm talking you- on, on, on some of the running plays, too. No, I was just making a joke. Uh, on some can, of- please, com- yeah. please compare Thomas Jones and Deontay Foreman. Oh, I'm totally different. Thomas Jones is five nine and a half, and and you know about two hundred and fifteen pounds. Um, you know, Foreman's a big back, so I I, the, I don't think they are comparable. You could compare Thomas Jones and Khalil Herbert because they would be more similar size, speed, style than than using. You know, Foreman you compare with Roshan, who's another big guy, but Foreman's bigger than Roshan. All right. Anthony Thomas come to mind, A-Train? I've never been an A-Train fan. Even, you know, I, I might have told the story, but you told, I, you told me, A, I did not like A-Train coming out. Yeah, you I told thought me he was, personally. Yeah. Okay, I thought he was stiff, you know, stiff in the hips. Didn't have a lot of forward lean. Uh, that was the 01 draft. So I'm in New York for it because I came here like three weeks after the draft. And um, the Bears took him. And I'm like, oh, when I was in New York, I'm going, that was a mistake on the Bears' part. Now, he had a great rookie year. Ran for 1,000 yards. But after that. He was just a guy, and for, for various reasons, but some of it was he's so damn stiff in the hips, and he ran so upright. So yeah. uh, he could do some things well, but I'm just, you know, I wasn't a fan. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions from the chat. Greg, uh, excuse me, uh, Jeff is asking, Greg, it appears to me that the front seven has made the biggest jump in the last few games. Would you agree with his assessment? Yeah, I think part of it is the secondary. It's still good intertwined with the secondary because the secondary is healthy. But the front seven, everybody's healthy on defense right now, Mm -hmm. except for Eddie. And – so they can work the the uh, rotation better. Uh, you know, basically, you, get, you got three new linebackers from last year. Because Sanborn's playing a different position, and you know he's playing Sam where he was Will and Mike last year, and you know, so it's uh, I think it's just everybody coming together. And you got a different guy, you know, setting up the game plan and calling the defense. Um, last question for you. Um, 
Homer, Homer is asking about Jalen Johnson's uh, payday. And we, we talked about Jalen Johnson and what his value is. And we'll talk about that more as the season comes to a close when we start giving heavy thought to free agency. But the trade deadline Monday is – uh, the trade deadline is coming up on Monday. What do you think? Are the Bears sellers or buyers? Oh, we lost him. But he's coming right back. There he is. <laughs> do you think yeah, the I'm Bears good. are sellers? Do you think the Bears are sellers or buyers? I, uh, you know, Bigsy's got a uh, a lot of connections. And Bigsy said the word on the street is the Bears are holding their cards basically stay in put and and your opinion on that is i'm fine with that well first of all except for the last couple of years the trade deadline in the nfl has been a non-entity it was an entity for the bears last year that you know they they made three deals traded for a guy got rid of two guys um it's you know, the media makes a bigger deal out of it. It's not like hockey and baseball where, you know, you got 75 to 100 trades done in a day. You get, you know, you if you get 10, that's huge in football. You know, it's very, very few people move. I think I, I read a thing today which was interesting, and it said trades are being influ influenced now because of all the analytics people involved in the front office and they're making decisions more on analytics. So, and that, that I never thought about that before and that could very well be true. And maybe that's one of the reasons the, the number has increased the last couple of years, but they got a long way to go before it touches the other major league sports. Yeah, indeed. All right, Greg, it's uh, victory Monday. We haven't had one of these. Uh, what, what, we had uh, one earlier, Weeks that one ago, two weeks ago. What are you talking about? That's true. You know, it, 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 so much losing. What is Eberflus's record now? I think it's five and eighteen. So, uh, last yeah, question. He, for he you. got a long. He's got a long way to go before he hits five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations to uh, the crook over in New England uh, for achieving a milestone. Uh, what what was it that he achieved the most victories as an NFL head coach? Is that what he did? No, he he, he hit 300. 300. There's only okay. been a couple coaches that have done it. All right. Well, good for him. And uh, and good for you, Greg. Great uh, job today. And thank you, Chris Watts. Uh, and for everyone who has been watching, we got tons of Bears programming this week. Again, like I said at the top of the show, subscribe to the Barroom Network on your YouTube channel. You'll get alerts on stuff. And also one other programming note, at the end of this week, we're going to debut a new show. Follow us at Bar Barroom Network, and we'll be talking much more about it uh, on our Tuesday night show. So uh, be watching out for this new Bears show. Greg, uh, love spending time with you. We'll see you next week. Okay, brother? Sounds good. Well, might have to go to Tuesday. I'll know later today or tomorrow you let me know and i will follow I'm, i gotta do something in the afternoon i just don't know what time it's at it's scheduled okay. for okay All right. you got it brother okay buddy take, take care later